not even right. the, the average Jewish person in Israel because they have some very extreme views and when you look at it if APAC is, is, is basically selecting our candidates for us and Bush is in the White House and his grandfather funded the Nazis then there's a there's a distinction bet between APAC and the Nazis like wh like what is that connection if you ha supposedly have a group that's Jewish how does a guy like Bush get in the White House so then when you even dig deeper into the the modalities of APAC you find it's not about Jews and you know so it's very hard to discuss because people come out and say anti-semitism but then you have to understand that what's being reflected through APAC is not even the will of Jewish people it has nothing to do really with Jewish people it goes back to the September 11th 1922 British mandate that created Palestine or created the, the future Zionist state out of Palestine so that whole that whole area gets murky but I'm straying from my theme it's September that we're talking about not August September 11th has a tragic resonance in the Middle East too. On the 11th of September 1922, ignoring Arab outrage, the British government proclaimed a mandate in Palestine, a follow-up to the 1917 Balfour Declaration, which Imperial Britain issued with its army massed outside the gates of Gaza. The Balfour Declaration promised European Zionists a national home for Jewish people. Now, people really don't get that, you know, APAC is mostly a Zionist organization. There are more Christian Zionists than there are Jewish Zionists. Exactly, and that's my point. There is a religious right Christian sector to the APAC movement that, you know, even Jews are saying, this does not reflect what we are about. And when you look at what's going on now, it's almost like that group has been usurped and it's being used for other purposes here to progress, you know, almost an Armageddon agenda where they want to go to war with Iran. Nuclear war with Iran doesn't benefit anybody who doesn't make nuclear weapons. Look, within the American Jewish community, there is obviously no, it's not monolithic. The American Jewish community is all over the place in terms of its politics, in terms of who it supports. The majority of American Jews are liberal. Between 70 and 80 percent vote Democrat. Largest numbers in terms of opposition to the war in Iraq. Now, within that, most American Jews are multi-issue people. Those who are politically engaged, right? If you're a politically engaged liberal, you probably care about the environment. You probably care about health care policy, education policy. You probably care about separation of religion and state. You probably care about international issues. Maybe you're concerned about Darfur. Maybe you're concerned about Tibet. One of your concerns might be peace in the Middle East. If you're a single issue person, which A means you're much less likely to be on the liberal left anyway. If you're what I would call an Israel firster, everything else is relegated into 5th, 10th, 20th place on your agenda. What almost exclusively matters is Israel. Then you would gravitate towards a single issue lobby like APAC. So I think first of all that suggests why APAC would be so unrepresentative from the get go in terms of the American Jewish community. Most American Jews, like everyone else, like, like other politically engaged people, care about a multiplicity of issues. The second point, what has happened in the last years is that there has been a tendency, encouraged, I say, t with terrible consequences, and there's a huge mistake, but encouraged by APAC, to conflate the neoconservative agenda and the Christian right evangelical agenda with the pro-Israel agenda. And I think what you see today is increasingly American Jews saying, wait, we are not in favor of those things. Iraq war, no. Bomb Iran, no. The Bush neocon project for the Middle East, no. The Zionist Christian evangelical dispensationalist project for a war of Armageddon and rapture and for the Jews to all either convert or be massacred, not so much either. So I think that's, that, that, embrace by APAC of those positions, of that ideology, of those groups who are so influential in the Bush administration, I think has created a disconnect. Right, right. Well, even Jimmy Carter came out about two weeks ago and said the problem is that Israel has so many nuclear weapons. So, you know, here you have an ex-president of the United States admitting to what Israel doesn't want to admit, that they have nuclear weapons. 
And I would think that any neighboring country would want to have the same if you know somebody right next door has them and probably aimed at you. Well, and, and then the other aspect that comes up with Jimmy Carter is Carter's national security advisor was Zbigniew Brzezinski. Right. And Brzezinski was more powerful than Carter at that time because of the deal he cut with the Mujahideen, funding them through the CIA, which later creates al-Qaeda. But more importantly, it secured the opium rights in Afghanistan because before 1978 through 80, when the CIA and Brzezinski were funding that effort, America got almost none of its heroin from Afghanistan. Now, as a result of what's going on, gone on as, and through the CIA funding of the Mujahideen, we get 90% of our heroin from Afghanistan now. That's no accident. The same people that funded the Mujahideen, Brzezinski and company, who are still influential and in power today, are the same people controlling that trade. And when you look at it, the only thing they won't tell you on TV is that it's all about you know th the drugs. They won't talk about the drug trafficking. And when you look at national security, they always claim national security. But the National Security Act was created in 1947 by Clark Clifford, who later was in charge, you know, for the American interest in BCCI, the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, which was the biggest money laundering bank on the face of the planet. A few weeks after September 11th, an FBI agent called the Whitney Museum of American Art and asked to see a drawing that was on exhibit there. The piece was by Mark Lombardi, an artist who died by his own hand several years ago. Using pencil, Lombardi had created an intricate pattern of curves and arcs to illustrate the links between global finance and international terrorism. In other drawings, Lombardi has explored subjects ranging from the Vatican Bank to Iran-Contra. The results are not only fascinating slices of history, but also works of art that look like constellations of stars on a dark night. They're all a kind of six degrees of separation exercise about events instead of people. Can you explain how Mark Lombardi began doing these kinds of drawings? Did he start out as an artist or as a researcher of conspiracies? Well, he actually started out as an art historian. Was he was he doing a lot of research? What was he what was he doing? He was uh, to four or five newspapers a day. He also collected hundreds of books and he would go through the indexes of the books and he would look at names and he would look for connections of names. And at that point he started uh, using index cards which at his death was 14,000 over 500 index cards. So Mark Lombardi wanted to write about this and he was describing to an attorney in Los Angeles the situation and it's the proverbial idea of the artist with the napkin whereby he makes a little sketch on a napkin, literally he did, and then he realized, hmm, this is quite interesting. So he intended to use these index cards to put them around a piece of paper and he thought, I'll diagram what I'm doing and it'll help me figure out all of these complicated affairs, the intricacies of them. And then what I will do is I'll make this sort of sketch and then I can write about it. Huh. He found that the drawing itself said, really, what he wanted to convey. Do you think these drawings appeal most to fans of conspiracy theories? Oh, I think that's that's certainly an audience for them. Uh, he's an artist artist, though. There are a great number of people in the art world who are fascinated with it because, one, the tons of information that is distilled, the beauty of the work, and the fact that he is presenting in art a great deal of information that is verifiable information. In your introduction, you talked about the FBI agent coming to look after 9-11. Yesterday, uh, members of Homeland Security asked to come and see the exhibition before it opened and having a work of art that has information that a government agency is looking at to verify certain facts is incredibly fascinating. They were intrigued by how Lombardi was presenting and dealing with the information. So we had a very informative and fascinating conversation about how computers present information and what Lombardi has done. Senator John Kerry, also a member, but none of them will talk about it. So is the secret skull and bone society a fraternal club for the elites, or is there something more to it? And then you have a, a core group. The core group seems to be all related. Uh, the, the basic family group at Skull and Bones is the Whitney and the Cabot family.
Uh -huh. Well, let's take a look at some of the illustrious members, if uh, my producer can put up this list. Henry Luce, for instance, was one of the members. He was known yeah. to hire a lot of members. William F. Buckley Jr., uh, Avril Harris.